Hi, I'm Paula Gloria, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. The reason the show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole is after the movie What the Bleep Do We Know became a success, I thought, aha, I have a lot of interviews with people who were on the movie, and I felt that our interviews went into the topic a little deeper because we had sort of a niche market. So when I saw how successful the movie was, I thought this would be a good idea for a public access television show. So on my show, I tried to go into topics a little more deeply than you'll find on mainstream media. And so for today's show, we have a special guest with us. His name is Dr. John Shelbourne. And he's a scientist, and Dr. John Shelbourne deals with zero-point energy. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. Um, what, what would you say to a lay audience, because you've seen the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, mm -hmm. about the kind of work that you're interested in? Well, what I'm doing right now is just conducting my own research related to zero-point energy or what other people might call excess power systems, systems that provide the type of power that we need for our uh, business and our daily lives that uh, does not require fuel and that is does not create pollution. And uh, the uh, source of this power is an ambient source like the environment and it's universally available and inexhaustible. So the thing has a lot of attractive features and uh, I'm basically trying to find uh, people who have built these devices and are willing to have them tested. Now, can you give the audience a little idea of your background? Well, <coughs> that you're I, not just dreaming this up. Out of right. Uh, well, I've always been interested in science. I, I grew up in the South, in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1990, I moved down here to Panama City, Florida. I started working with a government agency down here, and uh, I've got a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, Florida is a wonderful place because it's eclectic. There are a lot of different people uh, down here with various backgrounds and so forth. And, and so I guess I was sort of inspired after I got down here to research this area from a friend that I made here in the local area. So you have a strong science background. You went to college. And well, yes, I guess <laughs> you could say, you know, I also have a business degree, but um, uh, most of my research, I'm a mechanical engineer, and so most of my research is in the physics area, so it's just uh, sort of self-taught in this area. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So mechanical engineering is very practical. Yeah, uh, in mechanical engineering, basically you're dealing with machines or, or uh, um, things like heating and air conditioning. So, you know, this is something that's widespread. Yes. Well, that's really, really heartening for me and for mm -hmm. my viewers because mm -hmm. I try to uh, give them practical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the idea of having a business background mm -hmm. as well as an applied science background means that you can have a feeling for, um, for some of the problems of something as revolutionary as zero-point energy because right. it's going to have political imp implications, isn't it? Right, right. Well, um, it, it, you're right when you use the word revolutionary, not just because of the new science part of it. Uh, existing science um, will have to rethink their basic principles with this new science. And, uh, and since the source of the energy is everywhere, and if anybody has a device, a small energy converter, to be able to tap the source of energy, then uh, these uh, converters could be everywhere. They could be at your home or your business, uh, on, the, on the order of something like a lawnmower. That's, it. That's why I use the analogy. Of course, it's got an electrical part to it. But uh, I figure that um, once the science has been um, Prototype so that the average person can have access to this technology, that it will take no more mechanical know how than, um, say, your lawnmower, your typical lawnmower. Really? Yes, and that, that size device, since the energy is so concentrated, that size device would be able to power your whole house or your business. Um, do you think greedy businessmen might be upset that they can't control? Well, there's a large vested power interest right now in utilities and fuel sources in the world, oil, oil uh, coal, and nuclear principally. And uh, 
<clears throat> the uh, propagation of these devices in the environment will, will, regard, will require a lot of capital cost investments. So they need to rethink the way that they're going to reestablish their f portfolios. For you investment. mean to say it's going to cost a lot of money to give everybody these devices? Yeah. And sweet. after they've got them, mm -hmm. they're going to get the energy from for free. thin air. For yeah, free. The, the fuel part will disappear. I can see how that's a disaster for us. It's a, it's uh, a disaster for the people that, that are making their money with fuel stocks right now, but it's a wonderful thing for uh, the effects of combustion, whether it be conventional chemical combustion or nuclear combustion. It's a disaster for that, but it's a benefit for the environment because all of our problems in the environment, or most of it, in my opinion, is caused from the fact of combustion, whether it be chemical or nuclear. Well, now, once people know that these technologies might be viable, mm -hmm. don't you think that could cause a certain uh, political uproar? Well, that's true. Uh, or are they not that viable? <clears throat> are, you, are you a dreamer or are you practical? Well, I'm both. Um, uh, they are viable, but they're um, at a small scale not right now. In other words, they're just it's just in the hands of a few people. But there are some countries that sort of have gotten behind the development of these items. Let me assure you, Paula, that, that the governments all know about this, although it is a secret level. It's not public, publicized widely. And we know it as zero-point energy. But the actual energy is, is not derived from the zero point of uh, effects that we can observe, but it's coming from what we call a quantum mechanical vacuum, the emptiness of space. And so to call it zero-point energy is sort of a misnomer, but it's getting towards the source. I, now, I watched an interview that Alan Steinfeld did with Hal Putoff, yeah. and to try to make it graphic for a lay yeah. audience, he mm -hmm. said it was like scooping out space in front, or, or that this time-space matrix had energy all mm -hmm. around, but it was like scooping it out in front and putting it in the back to, to propel. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you could explain it in an easy way? Yes. Um, well, that that particular concept, I believe what he was referring to is a, a novel uh, propulsion concept for space vehicles, essentially where you would create something like an attractive mass, a gravitational uh, curvature like uh, around the Earth, you know, where something be attracted to the Earth, and then the opposite, a repulsive type of curvature of space behind it, creating what they call a surf, a surfing wave, or a wave that would tend to propel like a, su a surfer out here on the beach, right. here at Panama City Beach. Um, and that between those two, there's the, almost an infinite. Mm -hmm. You well, go very far. the extraction of energy occurs from the background of space. It's essentially what we think comes from nowhere. It comes from an area that can't be observed into something that we do observe and feel and touch and can use. But then once the, ener the energy is used up or the power and the heat is released and, and the energy is released back to the environment, that degrades back into the background of space sort of recycled back. So there's another way of looking at, you know, getting the, the package of parcel of energy from the vacuum of space, using it, and then sort of let it, letting it release. But the uh, effects on the environment are very low grade in this instance, and there's no um, <coughs> polluting byproducts other than a change in temperature, you know. We might have to work on that a little bit. Now, I don't know if anything's changed since the interview that Alan did with Hal Putoff, but mm -hmm. he had made one um, kind of astonishing comment. He said that we know that, uh, he goes, the physics can't quite do it, mm -hmm. but we know it's being done because that we know there's ships out there and they're not ours, and we know they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, the only reason I bring it up is because a lot of people say that um, what the bleak do we know mm -hmm. is not... Uh, it's a fairy tale that this, that the physics doesn't really say that developing a better attitude will mm -hmm. will help change your life. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm asking you, as a scientist watching this movie, mm -hmm. do you think? Because I heard Hal saying two things: one, that we can't really say that it can be done from the physics that we have, and yet we know it is being done. 
Well, that's true. Um, the theory has not caught up with the phenomenology. In other words, people are performing experiments which essentially show that there's a, a large part of the existing theory that doesn't fit the effects, the phenomenology. And so, uh, um, I think that's discovery the science. Existing theory is saying that it can't yeah. be done. No, the existing theory is, does not, is, is not able to be used to describe the effects of it. Uh, people make overarching statements saying, you know, well, it can't be done because the theory says that it can't be done. Well, I think they're mistaken in their usage and the language and everything. Our, our theories and our mathematics are just really rules. Uh, you have to work at the, what they call the uh, primary or the lowest level in, in theory to really get a, a grasp of what's happening, what's going on. Um, down to uh, the basis, the fundamental principles. Now, what is the primary level? What is the most basic level? Is it our mind? Well, the, the, yes, the primary level is um, uh, essentially where uh, we observe effects. You know, that's the primary level. Uh, you let in very well. You answered the question before you asked. But uh, yes, uh, even though uh, I think people tend to get away from this and they're fighting real hard right now to try to um, describe things like a tree falls in the forest and, and uh, you know you can't hear it but it really does fall in the forest. In right. other words there's no need for observation for reality to exist. Uh, I, I think they really haven't gotten around that yet. I think cognition or observation still is primary which falls within consciousness. Right. Now, along those lines, because right now um, I know my viewers mm -hmm. and I've gotten feedback from them through emails and things, that there's a lot of heartbreak about what's going on in Iraq. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of feeling, mm -hmm. this uneasy feeling that maybe my portfolio and my security does depend on that oil and mm -hmm. that lifestyle that I have does depend. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you could say as a scientist about tapping this mental or, or beyond mental, this conscious level. Any thoughts about how we as humanity can get to a point where mm -hmm. we deserve this much free energy? Well, that's true. You, you do bring up another good point, um, and you've anticipated the way the discussion is leading. And, and the point is, is that uh, this new source of energy um, is what I call a convergent type of energy. And, uh, is, is much more concentrated and more powerful than any energy that we know of right now, nuclear or chemical. And so, uh, being so powerful and being um, available everywhere, then uh, we have to develop an, an additional capacity to, to uh, be able to embrace this, to encompass it. Because, it. because uh, you know, and the tendency in the past is for human beings to tend to kill themselves. There's an, or others. there's an unconscious conflict that goes on that says, you know, will we continue to live? You know, will I make the decision to live today? That's made sort of like every minute, you know. Well, will the people with all the aggression and the disagreements in the world, uh, you know, unanimously agree to try to make another day? Well, this is really exacerbated with a new source of energy because this this has much more power. Hal put off, as you say, uh, he he referred to other others using it or in ships or was, outside of the earth. I, I was astonished, uh, and I felt it was Panama City and John Cheshire and this and this group of people <laughs> that he really had confidence would understand what he was saying with maturity. Yeah, because you know. But, but um, yeah, um, I, th I think when, when we observe new things in the environment, you know, we observe things that we don't understand. And part of it, you know, we, we, we think uh, that there's life in space. We know, we know that there's life in space. We're proof that life in space exists, but uh, we observe other things that tend to make us think there's life in space. And, and so, if they're able to, these entities or these things, whatever they are, if they come from other places, other solar systems, then if they're getting here, then uh, they probably um, 
what we observe, it looks like that they don't have to rely on a fuel source dragging a big tank like the space shuttle has to fly up with a big tank off the ground, you know, piggyback, right. you know. Right. They have no such big tanks or anything like that, and they're not nuclear either. So uh, I think that's where Hal Putoff may have been alluding to, is right. that others, others in quotation well, you know, others. there's a lot of people that are suspicious about our government. Mm -hmm. and some of the best um, criticism I heard, mm -hmm. well actually before I go into that, because I will go into that, let me tell you, with the movie What the Bleak Do We Know, mm -hmm. one of my favorite guests works with people who have uh, terminal diseases, mm -hmm. cancer, AIDS, and so on, mm -hmm. and he says the most important part of healing mm -hmm. is your mental attitude. Too. And he has been able, because he's a hypnotherapist, a medical hypnotherapist, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. says it's more dehypnotizing people mm -hmm. from this death sentence that exactly. they've been given mm -hmm. that brings about astonishing healing. Right. Now, he was the one that pointed out that he felt, as much as he liked the movie, mm -hmm. that most of the people coming out of the movie, he felt, didn't really understand it or didn't really believe that your, your mental attitude could change your life or, or if, if you had cancer, if you had AIDS. Mm -hmm. And rather than rejecting his comment, because I admired his work, and mm -hmm. he took people who should have been dead and mm -hmm. brought them to hell, mm -hmm. I thought instead of rejecting his comment about a movie I liked, mm -hmm. I embraced it, and I felt it made me appreciate more that movie and how practical it was. Mm -hmm. So by the same token, there are people who feel that uh, this knowledge about UFOs is just the government faking it, mm -hmm. wanting to cover up mischief that mm -hmm. they're doing politically, mm -hmm. giving people artificial hope mm -hmm. that uh, a, a utopia exists and mm -hmm. that free energy is a utopia. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, mm -hmm. um, when Hal said <coughs> his comment, well, there's other ships out mm -hmm. there and we know they're not ours and we know they're doing it, mm -hmm. um, he said it with such maturity, and I felt familiarity, although there are some uh, groups mm -hmm. that feel he's a dupe. Well, um, the, you can play that what if. I don't if. feel that, but... Yeah, you can, you can play a what if game um, for a long time, and you can end up sort of like wasting time. Uh, instead of experiments? Well, in, instead of trusting yourself. Okay. Basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, try that. Try, try um, uh, ask, asking for the truth. You just ask that uh, of yourself and out to the environment, and then ask for the proof. It's just the simple thing that anybody can do, and, and you can get the feedback. It will come back. Uh, for people, you know, it's an old, old idea that's repeated a lot. You know, they call it the law of sowing and reaping. You know, you just put out your intention if you want to receive the truth right. or a thing like new energy right, right. or a, a cure for a disease. Right. And um, you put that out in the, in the clearest form. Um, the most precise form that you can, and then you have to release it, which is equally important. Let it go, and then it will come back. That's the type of universe we, we uh, live in. We, we live in a universe that is sort of like a self-supporting dialogue, like that, you know. Speak out to it, it, will come, it comes back, it gives you the answer. It will bring back to you what you want. Uh, I've gotten so good at this thing, not, not you know, I'm, I'm not a millionaire, you know, I haven't got a lot of material things, but a lot of uh, answers that I've sent out, you know, seem all to get answered. Uh, so, it's, so, it's, so, 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 instead of depending on um, what others think or whether conspiracy right. exists, uh, let's get out of that mode. Let's get to where the individual seeks their own answer, and then we get there. So, so would you say, mm -hmm. as a scientist, mm -hmm. you would heartfeltfully, heartfully ask, yeah. is humanity ready to have free energy? 
Yeah. And can uh, I be a tool right. to bring this knowledge? Uh, my wife tells me all the time is that uh, we we uh, evolve at our own pace. We. Uh, it's that old statement that says, you know, well, you're where you're supposed to be at the time that you're supposed to be. You're evolving. Right. You can evolve um, in, in an enhanced manner, I think, by seeking to evolve. And so that um, uh, the point is, is that. Uh, wow, that's interesting. That's another uh, force of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, the, the point is, is that are we ready for a zero point energy or the energy from the vacuum is, is really the way it should be stated. Uh, uh, we're where we should be because if we had it right now in the world and we have a rack and we have uh, people are looking at their energy portfolios, no, we, we can't handle it. But um, the wild haired inventors, uh, whatever distributes responsible for spiritual equilibrium, uh, and uh, knowledge from above, you know, inspiration, mm -hmm. uh, inspires wild-haired garage inventors to be able to build these things, but they are not industrialists. They are not seeing it delivered out to the marketplace. Right, right, right. right. But, but in a small sector, they have it in hand. I assure you that they have it in hand. How interesting. So it seems you've also described intention mm -hmm. and focus. Mm -hmm. So it would take the intention and focus of scientists, but also of people, yeah. to say we are ready. Where of, right. of the struggle of the rat race. The the, the the investors that will be investing in this um, are among the same group overall that are going to have a change in mindset about how this will be used. So they'll be investing in an altruistic way instead of. They will be. Will it be they your will last be, investment. They no. They'll be no. No. Be? No. No. Not at all. <laughs> they they will be investing with higher knowledge, mm -hmm. so that it is applied properly. Now Buckminster Fuller, did you ever study any of his work? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, generally familiar, familiar. with him. Yeah. There's one producer in Manhattan Neighborhood Network. His name is Harold Chandler, and he's mm -hmm. had a public access show on for, for probably over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And whenever I see somebody that's been at something for a long time mm -hmm. in the face of um, uh, social approval, in other words, mm -hmm. particularly if they're not making a lot of money at it, mm -hmm. instead of saying, oh, this, this man's crazy, I, I go, wow, what would keep somebody so um, committed mm -hmm. to doing something, even though he's not being remunerated in the way we feel, mm -hmm. means he's successful. Mm -hmm. And he oftentimes quotes Buckminster Fuller mm -hmm. and says that as of 1972, scarcity was transcended. There were enough resources for everybody to get out of the, the of the grind of, mm -hmm. of earning a living and mm -hmm. working, although not equally distributed, I, I'm not sure if it, well. Okay, mm -hmm. distribution in terms of he said it was a design problem. He mm -hmm. said even all yeah. the pollution you see can mm -hmm. be boiled down to just chemicals, mm -hmm. and and uh, and it was just a matter of understanding how to rearrange them in such That's a right. way that we can survive. Mm -hmm. but that, it's not so grim as we think. Mm -hmm. But one thing was, is that our belief in money mm -hmm. to generate the power and the enthusiasm and the commitment that we need mm -hmm. is, is something that has to be dealt with. As long as people believe mm -hmm. that there is a limitation mm -hmm. that's determined by some having mm -hmm. and the majority not having, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to be limited. Well, that's right. It's a problem of mindset, and so you have you have this uh, problem of being able to bring in the new paradigm, but it's extended out to to all of society. It starts with the leaders, the movers and the shakers, the um, paradigm, you know, people who establish the paradigm. Uh, the the new paradigm, or changing yeah, the old one. The new paradigm. The new paradigm. To to to. to bring it in under the proper circumstances because um, I, th I think there probably are decision makers at, at high levels that do not know all about this problem or, and this potential that we've been discussing, but they, they also realize at the same time that it can't be just brought in to society arbitrarily 
it, we have to wait until uh, everybody, for instance, elects to disarm, you know, with conventional weapons, you know. There will be no like more scarcity of resources, for one thing. No more scarcity of resources. Right. And so no reason to have armaments, because that's what right. they're based on. And so a decision like that, and, and then a, a, a pace of progress, but we have an environmental problem that we have to deal with, the schedule that is presented to us, and uh, we're going to have to merge the schedules. And yet, when you talk about the environmental problem, mm -hmm. the country that is the most powerful yeah. is the one that, if, if power leads to security, mm -hmm. why the is America the greatest polluter? The certain decision makers aren't tied in, apparently, with some of the other decisions that are made in government. And that's something that I have to deal with. I'm a, a government employee myself. And um, uh, it's, it's really just a political problem, okay? And uh, it's an intractable, I mean, it's a process that's sort of like involuntary politics, you know? I think there's some people that say that the you know, the decisions are, are made and the politics proceeds after that. It's an artifact of the decisions made to start right. with. Uh, but, but those high-level people, decision makers, probably above governments, are going to have to deal with this large-scale environmental problem, which is the proverbial 800-pound gorilla. Right. So we've got the problem, but we have the solution. I just wanted to give one last thought. When I used to teach Transcendental Meditation in San Quentin Prison, the prisoners, the inmates, were saying, do you want me to close my eyes sitting next to this guy? But somehow the knowledge started to come and the serenity and the peace came so that there was that relaxation and even gang leaders were able to sit in the same room. Do you think that might be a little bit similar to letting go of our armaments? Mm -hmm. We have to be confident. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pe people need to feel confident and uh, reassured. Somebody needs to come along that can do that. So a scientist, by saying we've got it in the bag, maybe could be that. Oh, right. We, we, we ought to be able to show these things in public, you know. That some people call them perpetual motion machines, you know. Uh -huh. And, the, and then the scientists say, well, that can't be done, you know, but we tend to show, you know, that we have a new environmental source which they don't recognize, you know, okay. so that's for resolving the problem. Well, that's fabulous. Thank <laughs> you for joining us. And my name is Paula Gloria, and this show has been farther down the rabbit hole. Thank you for joining me, and we will be hearing more from John Shelbourne in the future. <laughs>